Okay, we're into part two of the wiper module build. Slowly taking you across. We're doing the Molex plug now, everybody. So, putting the cables into the Molex connectors, and then we can begin actually testing some of the outputs on this. So, building up a loom for it, you can see the cables going down there and coming out on the the wire spools. There, we build the cable up, and as as we go along, we make notes of the cables and what they actually do in respect to the module, triggering the uh, cycles, putting outputs to the washers etc. got here in my hand a washer pump which I bought at Car Boots or Auto Jumble. It's a Lucas one, I like these uh, just because it's branded. The Chinatown ones, the brushes aren't as good on them. I've had a few fail over the years. I mean over the 20 years. Uh, yes, yeah, this is Lucas, just a 12 volt washer, self priming washer. That so we're going to actually connect that washer up and initiate a cycle on the, the unit now, and we should get things starting to happen. Well, all we need then to finish the testing of it is the wiper motor itself, but we're going to simulate that with a simple bulb. And then, once I'm happy that I've got all the cables correct and the Molex plugs right. We need to add another plug for the uh, intermittent controller. We're actually going to be using a, a um, 10 position uh, rotary switch with resistors built into it rather than a variable, what they call a part or a potentiometer, simply because I think that a step control gives you more feel. Click, click, click for the, for the um, timing. And that way also you don't need to look at it, you can count the clicks and you can set a click to be a fixed time period. If you have a variable one, it's harder to do, uh, actually get a solid feel. Whilst it'll work just as well, I like the idea that you can click and I'll count four clicks is four seconds or whatever. I'll do it that way. So that'll be changed. We'll also need a smaller plug for it. We're out of pins on the Molex plug there. So we can't put any more connectors on. We'll have to add another connector to this. as more wires in it than I, uh, I thought on that Molex. But we have got other Molexes just over here on the floors, all my wiring equipment. And here is the Molex packs, threes, fours, different types of Molex packs which we can use. And then there's all sorts of fuses and things all laid out in the boxes. I think we've gone through this before. Great to lay all your stuff out. Lighting's a little bit dim, I've just noticed. I've just got two stage lights in the workshop. That gives us a bit more brightness, sorry for that. So you can see those things better. In the background, and just a very sneaky preview, you'll see some seats that are retrimmed, but that's all part of uh, the next episode, not in electronics build. So a little sneaky look for you, or we shouldn't do really, okay, because it's not part of the main build. You're on the electronics you're on the, the spin-off series of films where we do technical stuff and where we have our, our bramble chats and rambles. These little side videos are something which I'm thinking of keeping up even when the car project's finished because a lot of people asked me and just said, will you continue to make films after the car's done? Well, of course we will. And we can make films on general maintenance, on tweaks, tune-ups of the cars, road trips and all things like that so we'll keep on filming because I do enjoy making the films and interacting with the the people on YouTube and Patreon and we do it found that those live launches are what they call the premieres have been popular so I do like doing the premieres I actually quite enjoy it I guess it's equivalent to you go out to the pub you don't anymore I'm stuck on so there's me a victim of social media of course the a hypocrite that I am then really because I'm not an advocate uh, well particularly Facebook uh, even though it has its uses which can be very good I've refrained from for a number of reasons but uh, that's another subject but uh, yeah it looks like I'm in interacting with you on the live charts it's time to make a few more notes about some cables it's time to connect this up Let's see what we get. Let's run a cycle with just the washer pump connected for washer module completion. 
with the wiring loom all built up and the molex all built up these are just self-assembly molexes I solder the pins on you can crimp the pins I think it's uh, better with solder for me that is the multifunction plug everything is in one plug we've managed to get all the outputs in one plug the control resistor for the intermittent delay just plugs in on a little two pin plug there just got it mocked up like that but that'll be a, a longer lead going to the console and I select a switch but it's time now to wrap this in the Ford loom tape just to keep it looking original I'll leave the tails at the end there so we'll just wrap up to a, up to the point where them cables come out and then we'll have to reconnect him because we don't exactly know the length they're going to have to be we know if we walk slowly over to the dash pod approximately where the module is going to be which is just going to be under the lower section so that would just plug in the module would just be underneath the lower section of the dash so with that in mind I'll wrap this okay with my Ford loom tape and then we'll, we'll clear the bench down again so I've te checked it all it's all running I've, I've had to simulate the outputs with relays because the pump the washer pump I did have it but it doesn't like running dry it started to sound a bit strange when it was running dry with no water in it not a good idea so to test the outputs I've connected a relay to uh, the wiring harness and one relay simulates the motor the wiper motor the other one simulates the washer pump the wiper motor one itself actually builds itself into the Ford loom the Ford foot operated switch is a three pin affair and this is a three pin relay normally open and normally close which that will be hooking into the Ford's loom I'll show you what I mean slowly again over to the um, electronics stores department and there should be a little plug in here there it is which is the plug that fits on the washer switch pedal which is a, a normally open normally closed plug and what happens is this is unplugged we then access the switch for our triggering system for this and this relay goes where that plug would fit so that substitutes itself in those three cables wouldn't actually connect to this but the three cables coming out of the the, the har harness of the car would hook across these three pins of this relay and this would then simulate my foot pressing the switch the relay is just a, a slave so that would complete it I'll wrap this and uh, we'll have a clean up and then we'll summarize how far we got with the module but it is all done it's all plugged in it all fits in nicely I've added a fuse there you can see just here which is a low ampage fuse for the electronics only the relays themselves they have their own separate feed I've marked it all up I've written it all down I'll type this into the computer but um, some of these cables that yellow for example is a fused feed totally independent of the circuit that just goes through the relays and that is for the washer uh, pump and also the trigger to the relay it's mainly to fuse the washer pump so that will go on a, a, a spade terminal on the extra fuse box that we fit and be marked up washer pump fused for the washer pump the wipers themselves because it's a slave relay use the existing Ford fuse in the fuse box because you're not interfering with the loom that's the great thing about this if I unplug it the car revert, reverts back to normal standard Ford setup and this can actually be unplugged if it, if it failed you just swap the plug across and you're back on it's not going to fail but if you didn't want it you just unplug it and it's not uh, interfered with the wiring looks a mess here as we've already discussed about the table getting in a mess we know about this but it all tidies up the point is the modules good so can box it and we can uh, put that to one side soon we can test it if I plug that into there that simulates my wiper delay for the intermittent setting we can test everything out so let's wrap that with a loom tape I'll show you the loom tape across here we've got as close as you can get to Ford with the grey 
it's non-adhesive so you have to start it off with a little bit of harness tape and then wrap it and finalize with some harness tape or you can use um, a glue to finish off as well not quite sure how the factory did it I think they somehow glued the end probably with a two-part contact adhesive it looked like when I've taken looms apart before leave this to me I shall now wrap the loom okay with a quick tidy up of the bench and a, a loom build a loom wrap into the multi plug we go and then that lead there coming out for the adjuster the inter intermittent delay will be here uh, steering column mounted with a rotary switch as I discussed we now have the mocked up washer pump and head uh, wiper motor simulations there with those relays I've put a couple of lights on them just so you for you for demonstration purposes really so at the moment uh, everything's idle there's power to the unit just standby power you can see the the clock ticking there the red light so we're ready now to do our first switch which would be up on the stalk would give 12 volts to this cable which is intermittent so on we go and now indeed the wiper motor slave relay goes and that would trigger the contacts of the motor override the park switch of the motor set it in motion for one cycle adjusting this now it increases or decreases the delay as I've pointed out though we've not got the right resistors set on this just yet so it would be a bigger range than what I've got you can see it's faster now and then turning down for slower so that is that system you can't have that on with any other system the switch will only allow that to be on on its own so disconnect the power to it simulating switch on the stalk that will fit now nothing happens and now we're going to do our standard wash with post wipe delay so that's just a foot operated wash now 12 volts on this cable in your screen there this is the wire for the wash post wash post wipe cycle I'll trigger that stand back for you it, it pulses a bit there because I, I touched it on but it's permanently on so my foot's on so I'll just get constant wipe uh, constant wipe and constant water jets go into the screen till I release I've released and now you'll get that post wipe delay and then it'll shut down any second now will come up there we go one wipe and finish that cycle but nothing happens now until I redo it and it always counts on only up in the point where I release the washer so you could keep that on and no, you would get no post wipe until I release and then it begins the count that way it's always in it uh, always an even post wipe the same amount of seconds each time that's that and then the last feature is the fully automated system which in turn makes this yellow wire go live at the moment that's dead that supplies the sorry that's not that's the feed the white wire supplies the feed to the automatic rain sensing computer which is a separate module computer rain sensor computer will not be active at the moment that that wire is dead it's only active when I pull down on the stalk and I activate at least one automatic cycle that will put rain X on the screen so helping with the screen uh, cleaning and um, not only cleaning but it also applies the rain X primes the rain sensor ready keeps it gives it a good chance of having a clean sensor pad area and then we'll do it'll do one cycle and I won't be able to put hold on the washer jet with my foot it, once you touch that it's up to the computer what it does with the washer jets you can't force extra water on you can if you want because you can actually have the um, I can configure this if I wanted to so that I can still pulse water during a fully automated cycle that's up to us to have as an option you can do that and both will run parallel side by side so that's an interesting combination when you get that so we can do it um, so they'll run in parallel that would be the 
wash uh, permanent wash when you're pressing but at the moment if I just did it this way we will get let's trigger it we will get that wash wash again and, and wiping off and then you'll get one post wipe which is virtually the same delay as the um, the other post wipe so that's it that's gone then the system kicks out and it's gone if you wanted to you could join both uh, wires together on the switch so that even when it's doing post wipe I'll demonstrate what I mean um, not post wipe automatic so fully automatic system but if I wanted to I can top up with my foot whilst it's doing an automatic cycle and it'll continue to wash the screen and still post wipe so if you wanted you could still blast water at it if you just do the the one touch you get what the computer wants in water terms and you may decide that's not enough now I can either change it on the computer chip and not the computer chip but the timing chip or I can just use my foot to add water to it or if I want I can just quickly tap that switch and it'll do it all for me so that can be configured if we want a little bit of flexibility in it there but well, that's it really everything's running as it should the wires come out there they're all labeled up so I know what they do we have a separate fused feed so if there's any problems they've got a fused feed to the outputs of it a separate fuse for the computer side of things or the microelectronics side of things if they were to go wrong you take that fuse out if that fuse does go and the system drops out it will still operate um, you can still get some operation on it so you wouldn't lose your wipers it would just default to normal operation so that's a good safety feature as well so we've covered all angles lid can go on that's the end of the unit we're all done there there's your loom nicely wrapped here's our leads coming out ready to connect into the harness of the car when we start to build that but the idea is to build sub modules and as you can see that's what we did sub module for the mp3 system sub module for the multifunction one in lamp and now our third sub module the fully automated wiping system then after that we get the rain sensing device which is already built it's in the drawer and already built any modules that are ready to be fitted are down here in the drawer there it is in this box we've got an immobilizer there too these are again more subsystems but already done because they're off the shelf so the hard job was what we did this motor didn't like being run dry so that's why I just put for demonstration purposes these relays substituting the wiper motor and the wiper washer and that is it that's all it was all done all running we're all tidied up all ready to go so now it's time to move on to I don't think there's another module just yet it's time to start building this into the dash itself so that will be our next job to start laying these out behind the dash it's all on a nice panel over there so we can start fitting into that and making our subsystems all join up so we can call that a day for today that's a nice little bit of three or four hours work to build this wire the molex everything's neat this does come out there's enough cable to lift the circuit board out and work on it if you had to modify it would be the most likely option this stuff is very very bulletproof it is bulletproof it's tried and tested electronics 1980s late 70s electronics tried and tested pretty straightforward CMOS technology pretty reliable there's an argument to put a 12 volt voltage regulator on the whole system I'll look into that, it's easily done, I can just tie it in here but for now I'm pleased with how neat it is just one connection, or two connections, one multi one variable resistor and that's the whole lot away you go, just unplug and you're good to go can't do it with one hand good old Molexes, tough stuff there you go Let's put that to one side now and move on to something else we can clear our mind of this freeze up some mental space now too so that we can start thinking of other things because until that is done it occupies space in your head okay 
I've had the, the MP3 on all the time while I've been building the system. That gives you a chance to not only have music that you want, no adverts, and also you're testing the system all the time, which is great. So off we go for that. These songs are quiet at the beginning. Clutching at straws, Marillion. So that's running all the time, which is good, good, good news. Everything working great. I shall break this part of the film. We'll move on to something else. See you in a sec. Okay, with the modules done, I've decided I've got to get these door cards ready for treating the wood panels. We just use a hydro dip process. We'll show you that later on. But we have got some shrink graphics, which may also fit. So. We'll talk about that, but first, before we do, the door cards need to be stripped down. One's already done, if you look back through the Bramble video earlier on, halfway through, I think it's about episode 10, we're taking a card apart, don't quote me on that episode number, and we get uh, the template, we've already done one, this is the other, now it's a mirror image, so we don't need to re-template this, it's just inverted. I've also got some new metal top caps these are damaged which we had on some spare cards luckily because two door ones are different but we did have some spare two door cards which we got off that portuguese breaker which uh these have now been powder coated i'll show you them nearer the time for now though we need to strip these down slight sore throat but no cold yet for a record for me so far <laughs> i'll probably get it but um yeah we're all right these door card vinyls are actually undamaged, they're creased, but there's no puncture marks in them that I can see. So we're going to get away, we're reforming these over some new hardboard backs. But before we do, we want to get these treated, these um, wooden caps, because they're very faded out. There's some dents on this one, unfortunately, there. We're going to see what we can do without we can body fill that and then re-dip it if we have to. The dipping process is uh, called hydro dip and you can cover your uh, parts in a wood grain finish like we did on Ruby. Works out very well. So let's get the picks out. Now we need a selection of picks. They're just over here and these picks will allow us to get into these little trim fastening pieces which are a one-way affair, but if you hook up, you can get in and we can release the these clips which hold the wooden, fake wood cappings in and we can get <coughs> everything to do with fake wood gets put to one side for the hydro dipping company to attend to. They're making a collection today, so that is why we've switched to this aspect. So we are actually in episode 34 because this is not a spin-off. You may get some cross interference, who knows, that bits that were meant to be in a spin-off end up in 34, apologies if they do. It'll just be the way that my footage goes together because you can't always be on tech films. Let's get down and unclip all these. Okay, coming into your shot now, right now. Here we go. Here's the pick, or one of the picks. Just go in. I'm trying not to block your view, of course. We don't want to annoy you with our angles. That one's going. I'm just going in with a little opening. Go opposite sides on these little clips. We will go. Some just appear to be harder to get up than others. But it will go. Don't want to damage them. And you normally don't damage them. It's just one of those little tricky jobs. A hook either side, hopefully. And stay with us. This one's trickier than the last two are just drums because the camera's rolling so it picks a hard one. I 
This one is a tricky one. Struggle with me then. There we go. Offer it up to you so you can see. Let's try this trick to get the camera to lock the focus. And that's the clip. I'm trying for you. It's the best I'm going to Should we try another? Come on. Hooray. Into the little magnetic tray. Hooray for the tray. Little cup up there. Now this door card is really past it. Doesn't really matter. Get a little bit of crush down on the card because the card's gone. No one on its way now. They're just like sort of spires, not even spire clips. I don't know what you'd call them. But so far, they've all survived. Will we lose any? I think this clips, this trim's basically off. This one is stuck with it, so that's now three. And the only bit we need out of this is this vinyl, which is almost detached anyway. It's going to come off. Watch, it's glued on, but luckily for us, most of the glue's broken down. <clears throat> There's a, a foam backing pad as well to it, which will, will replicate, carefully taking this off, so as to save the foam, if it can't be saved, actually that foam's alright, it'll be okay, oh, it's, a bit, it's a bit gone here, we're going to have to just look at that, that just gives you a bit of a, a padded out feel to the, uh, the finish. This you can see has got damage there, but that's hidden by the seat, so really we can get away with that. There's no need to touch it. These will need cleaning up and recolouring because there's some UV. You can see the original colour, so UV faded, but with our um, special paints that we've got, we're all right with that. This is gone, there's nothing we can do. We'll, we'll, we will keep it, but it's uh, the metal's rusted. You could repair that. <coughs> of course, it's only metal, and you know we can weld, so we could fix this if we had to. So this card would stay in stock for future use, or to help somebody else with theirs. Now we've got the panel off. We just need to detach this chrome backing plate. There's one more clip, which is rusted quite bad. I say that it'll probably salvage off actually. And this is where I don't want to get a localised impact point on the trim. Let's get you a bit better view. Rare view of the lip zoom. So one more left, which came off through the car. So a little bit trickier to get this one. without doing a localised dent, although I must admit you wouldn't actually see it because we've got a two parts sandwich together here so if it did damage that, it actually wouldn't be seen. Of course we don't want to, I don't want to slip with the pick and stab my hand so I'm wary of that too. Trying to get something in. You can't just pull on them because they're a one way clip, you need to go backwards on it. Leave that with me because I don't want to bore you with lost, we're trying to get that off but suffice to say one more clip to go and then the wood panel
comes off or the fake veneer comes off we'll strip all these down including the front two door cards just off off your screen okay you're in to the main door card front door card that's off there's one piece so we now carry on I did find a way once I got the clip to a certain point you could actually un not unscrew it but you actually rotate it giving a, a sort of screw effect whoa <laughs> straight off these aren't as rusty as the back ones I don't know if that makes them easy to, to take off or not but Hey, as Jim says. Hey, very happy today. Hope that you are happy in YouTube and Patreon land as well. Don't forget, uh, Patreon's always open for you if you want to support the channel because the YouTube revenue till we get into the millions. We can't pay for this car. These things drain your cash. These are going nice. If, it go, <clears throat> if they're going nice, you can you can stay on. And it's not like keeping you on when there's no action. It's all about the pick. And they are reusable. We're not damaging them. For some reason, this door card survived a lot better. So you can see, it's the same procedure for this door card. There's another, <coughs> there's another two, that one's missing. We've got one missing clip, moving it across into your centralized view going good with this type pick just use that type pick <clears throat> of course the camera does take a while to lock on to close focus shots and with the viewfinder I can't always see if you're locked on so it's not quite focused you just have to use your imagination on the pick design but you can get sets of these from machine mart or ebay very handy to have in your tool collection the day that you need them whoa <laughs> straight out and it's fun who could who could afford to make unclipping clips interesting as you say, uh, it's not interesting. That's it. Those went a bit better. Getting up a collection of them now. Remove this, back into view for you. Back of it now. There we have it. Detaches from its aluminium backing plate. These can just be washed down and cleaned and then lightly buffed up. Now they are, they are marked a little bit and these are specific to two door so we're going to, have to just clean that edge the best that we can the aluminium has tended to corrode i don't think i've got any others of those here's the dents <clears throat> we'll, we'll have to lightly hammer those out don't know how that's got dented just there but when you hydro dip you can skim fill that if you want because this is all gone so that's easy to fix Okay, that door card, then we'll leave it as one whole unit. Finding safe places for these is going to be tricky. Right, I'll do the same with this door card, then we're done. We'll get a collection of powder coating together, uh, hydro dipping together. Right back. Guys, things are good, and we've come up with a great idea of what to do next. You saw. Apart from me spinning around on my chair, the module completion. Well, we'll put them away for now, although we have kept the MP3 going because that's good for background sounds, all the sounds around. But what I've decided to do is a clock 
refurb. It's going to have to be done at some point. So between jobs, let's get these instruments really nicely refurbished. There's a couple of options out there. We have got here different dashes. Well, we'll have to see what we've got. That's an L one, so we won't be using this. But we've got a couple of options on the dash bubble wrapped up here that we've kept over the years. What we've got here. That's a XL. No go. This should be the GXL one. If not, then I've got to go back. L dash. So these three actually not much use. So we could get parts off them. It depends, like the casings and stuff. But they all look. These all look rusty. We're up against. We've got a set here, and we have got Bramble set. We're going to dig it out. So we're going to line up some options for our dashes and we're going to see which ones are the least damaged and um, which face plates to pick from a range of face plates that I'm going to probably have in stock so we'll have to go and, and find out what we got and simply because refurbing that face plate is probably quite tricky to do the rust builds up on the clocks you can see on this one that the rust has built up on it just about get it into the camera for you there. So we have got options over here. Scoot away from you. I've got a, a new face speedo. I thought it was actually a zeroed speedo. There's somewhere I've got a zeroed speedo. This face anyway on this one is in good nick. The needle's damaged, but it will it will repaint it's been bent that needle I've straightened it so this actual face is good and we can match the odometer reading to match what it was when the car came out or we can reset it to zero depending on on what we want to do uh, I've got a clock face and a rev counter although hey I don't think we'll be using this one well, that one may work that one's gone. Too damaged. This clock face could be okay. So we're going to line up everything we've got. Take a look. Let's take you around. Line everything up. And then start the strip down of our clocks. I'll get my ugly mug out of shot and get you into shot. And we'll start by taking this dash cluster apart. And then I go nip across into stores again and just bring out the ruby dash as well this isn't ruby's dash and we'll just put everything out and we'll make the best what we can with all this stuff sorry about the jump there with all this stuff we'll make the best that we can dashboard wise for that and we'll get some led bulbs fitted indeed i've got one being mocked up here an ebay one this was in pink or sort of a ruby color just see that off to the right of your screen we need to go on eBay tonight and order some bulbs. We're going to try Ice White because of the silver car. I think would be good. Ruby had uh, this because of the, uh, the yellow and the orange, the red went together. I think either Ice White or I could do Ruby bulb set again like I did with uh, Ruby, uh, where the instrument panel and the cluster gauge all had the the coloured sort of uh, purpley coloured LED illumination in them. Bulbs like this. These ones, this size, don't actually fit into the clusters here. They will fit into your, your four pod centre, but they won't go into the back of... I'll show you what I mean. These cutouts here, we stick. Now you could slightly alter the cutouts, but I'm going to get the difference, a different type of bulb, more of a wedge shape. I'll make sure I get the high power ones. This does require quite a bit of power. We're going to go nip over and just get the other dash cluster. I'll be back very shortly. Okay, swiftly back into your shot is Ruby's dash. And I have pinched the speedo out of it. But I don't know where it is. We've got a missing speedo, everybody. Um, somewhere. Bramble speedo has gone. A little walk. Why and where? I'm not sure. However, 
we can certainly carry on looking at we've got a clock here we need to see if the clock works if I recall on Bramble the clock did work does it keep good time we need to leave it running overnight and um, ground is the top one well it doesn't matter which way around it's just a solenoid it would if it was in the car yeah that's straight in that's a good clock in terms of the contacts because a lot of them you have to tap to get them to wake up because the contacts inside the clock are quite often gummed up I'll show you what I mean if I can get a clock mm, we haven't got a clock just here we will have soon we'll, we'll talk about that we're going to keep our eye on this and see if it keeps good time so I'll set that overnight and we'll leave it running a couple of days we really need to leave it running see if we lose any time uh, hit and miss I've had some keep perfect time Ruby's does Swampy's loses Tina G's gains they're all different this one doesn't even wake up this clock here and we could open that up and have a look now looking at the face straight away now let's uh, zoom you in we'll go in close so you can see what you think about the clock face itself here but I'm already seeing that it, to me being careful not to touch it with this screwdriver that we're actually pretty good we're not rusted up on the clock face there so we're going to keep that one for sure this little operating rod for changing the time needs some help because the thread is snapped off the end of it so you lose your adjuster I think it has there's only a little bit left there's a little bit left there these often break it's rusted so it needs de-rusting so we've got to take the clock apart to get that out and de-rust it then paint it back in sat in black again because that'll let the, that'll let the instrument down so we want to get that little rod out of the clock obviously keep our eyes on the clock then this white hand here needs just some white paint with a cotton bud on it we'll take that off you can take the hands off we'll do it off the clock of course these could do the freshen up with some day glow which we have and then we're running there Let's pan you across then to the to Bramble's rev counter and you'll notice as well the rev counter on this car. Let's get you out. Sorry about that, I just kept the zoom on. I'll try and keep you, you in. And now we take you back in. Hopefully you'll focus on any minute now. This rev counter then faded there on the triangle okay but let's look at the actual the difficult thing the triangle's not a problem I'll show you what I would mean about that in a minute two little screws that lock it in they've rusted on the face they need I'll take one out at a time de-rust it and put it back in this the center cap of the speedo they have the rev, ga rev gauge needle pointer is um, sort of faded out it's not a nice jet black if you look these needles don't come off so whatever we do to this needle or dial indicator or whatever you want to call it needs to be done on the um, the dial itself as it's built up completed in other words we can't pop that off like we can with a clock at least I don't think we can here's a damaged um, rev counter I've got it in my other hand I'm just going to see if oh they do pop off we're okay we're in show you what I mean we have a needle from the other clock now we may well be able to find a better one this one's not the best counterweighted needle we could probably do something with that or indeed with this one where we'll just paint in very carefully and let the paint run out and fill in that little area with satin so we'll get the, the satin black paint dab it on the screwdriver with, the, with obviously with the needle off, off the gauge and tap it in until it just pulls a little bit and hopefully it should run in and infill that evenly then we can use day glow paint on this needle and touch it in the face is good so we're happy we don't need to do anything with that just a very light brush uh, a lens brush is good for this a very loose soft bristled lens brush for cameras and just dust it down obviously I said about the two screws then you have this effect with the cellar tape here this is the, the uh, indicator left indicator green um, lens and I think it's just out of your screen that zooming back for a sec so you can see this is the indicator so the cellar tape crinkles on the back of them I'll show you what I mean this high beam lights done the same thing here's 
of one coming into screen with a high beam and the sellotape crinkles and you get a sort of ripple effect which you can see when the lamp lights up we don't want that to happen we want it to be an even uh, green pattern and indeed for any other colours you'll see what I mean on this now look you see the high beam lights not an even blue you can see patches where the wrinkle is maybe with this LED torch and your camera my camera and your screen I mean you may not quite see what I mean about the wrinkle but it is there we want that fixing well, all you do with that is take the sellotape off and just reapply it and clean the disc they're like a little colored disc so they're okay to do okay the clock itself still ticking away the actual body of the uh, dash cluster can go into the what into the um, dishwasher so we'll do that tonight so this body here comes apart take everything out uh, I'm going to zoom you fully out now don't you love that ticking noise take up take these clocks off put this in the dishwasher and the plastic top so I'm going to move you back now we're going to pause the screen and move you back hold on okay so we have this front panel and the back light diffusing panel this is badly rusted so that's going to need some delicate cleaning this will just pop out like that so this as you can see should all be in white and with these light diffusing patches painted in at the back I don't want to damage those but what I'm going to do is just gently clean this up the best that I can and then mask that off and try and repaint in the white to, to clean that up difficult um, we could look at the the ones on our other gauges and we could find that because the L gauge isn't the um, this metal pressing is the same so we could go and salvage one off a better condition one because that's that's it'd be nice to actually keep Bramble's original but I think for this really the best thing to do for this would be to shot blast it back and, and recover it I'd even been tempted to powder coat that but it's just that you'd lose this blue can you see that how the factory do this for the lamps it's so that it creates a diffusion color it back reflects the color of the um, the bulb you can see the bulb there these are the general illumination bulbs there's three of them that just light up the the gauges and the backlight and they also reflect onto the dial face itself so your bulb lands on there the light and then it's reflected actually onto that so that's to do with reflect, reflecting light back and it must create a kind of like a give it a certain hue which is sympathetic to the illumination uh, perhaps if it was all white that you would get some kind of artifact I don't know it could be just a yellow finish to it not as crisp I'm not sure but there'll be a reason in optics optic language why this is painted that color in particular that blue you see it a lot on the gauges in fact let's show you an example of that on another gauge on a, an amp gauge grabbing and bringing into your view any second now is one of the amp gauges and look how they've done it again the same they've painted this in the area where the bulb is with that blue I don't really know exactly what color effect that it gives it's not it's not actually a color uh, as such in other words it's not it's not blue but it, it isn't harsh white it must do something to it whether it scatters the light mats gives it a matte effect I'm not sure um, there'll be a reason for this someone out there is going to know why they use this particular color and then indeed go darker in the corner where in the areas where the lamps are so if we were to put it in yeah this um, each bulbs around that area and that area I'd like to know anyway back to the plastics we can put this in the dishwasher nothing to stop that and the blue um, back of the cluster as well once we take the clock out of here we'll connect it back onto the power supply on the bench and leave it ticking overnight and see if it gains or loses time in fact it, it was running in Bramble when I was running the car as a demonstration as a 
the show car as was condition with all the brambles on it I just couldn't recall if it kept time or not but you hear it nicely ticking away it's a lovely sound very hypnotic sound on the clocks an essential thing to have I could never not have that I could never sort of remake one of these with a, um, a quartz I always need to have that clunking sound and you can see that it's generated from the back of the clock there's the jewels and the mechanism made by Kenzel Kenzel let's see how you pronounce that Kienzel but if it's if it's German or Swiss or it's going to be Kienzel or however you would pronounce that Kienzel Kienzel however it is they're a nice little made piece these clocks but they do fail there's a solenoid inside and the solenoid pulls in on the the wind up mechanism the two electrical contacts eventually meet uh, when the clock's running out of spring torsion if that's the right word and then the contacts join together and then it re-energizes and, and winds it up and throws a counterweight round it's clever but they are unreliable they're very hit and miss these clocks so you can get them and they can be on time or way out there is an adjusting screw at the back here and I could get to it with this watchmaker screwdriver, a slightly smaller screw, this might do it and that advances or retards the time if you're losing time but it's quite hit and miss to get it I've had several attempts getting these calibrated could be an idea to find an old school watchmaker and see, take his opinion on that or indeed there could be somebody out there in YouTube land who could tell us a way of calibrating this quite accurately they may say that the cogs are worn and that's part of the mechanisms worn and you're never going to get it to, to keep time or you know because they can either gain or they can lose the adjustment screw itself I'm not a watchmaker I'm just going to see whereabouts that goes we could take it apart and have a look these do come apart the adjustment screw itself goes down and deep inside the, the clock nice when they're running nice when they keep time an essential part of the dashboard so we will be keeping that going you could put a quartz uh, system in here and remove this and create a false wind-up sound by just having this free running but it wouldn't be the same it's not going to echo the same inside the dash you won't get the same acoustics with it if you had a remote clump click you just heard it click again there it's a lovely sound so we have to have it it has to be the real deal clock there's no substitutes so clock we clean the needles paint them up Rev counter is good to go. We have a missing speedo. I don't know why. Bramble speedo is AWOL. I need to find out why it's AWOL. I'd like to get my hands back on it, please. This isn't it here. But this could be Brambles. We could make this and match the, the digits in. Okay. And these can be calibrated to suit your car by moving the veins on the, the eddy current generator. This is a how it works you get a um, disc which spins round a central shaft which is connected to the dial indicator and the speedo needle and it's sprung what happens is as this rotates it creates a slight magnetic force or eddy current inside the center and spins it round so the faster I spin these cups you would call them cups the cups spin round they're very closely within a couple of mil spaced away from that center disc and the faster they spin they drag the disc round as they induce the currents as the speed increases and how you can calibrate these to a degree anyway is you can widen or narrow the vein spacing or the cup spacing this is probably couldn't go much closer if you're over reading if it's reading too fast you can do it if it's reading too slow you can't but if it's reading too fast you can slightly widen out the cup spacing and get it down I've done it on swampy and swampy is to live in one mile an hour of the sat nav so and that was by trial and error by having this on my lap and just turning this as the dash was out of the car I was driving it so I'd go on the dual carriageway have this on my lap quickly glance at it it was wrong pull over alter that drive quickly glance until I got it exact 
So we could do the same with this one. We could actually do it on the bench with the gearbox if we wanted to as well. There is a way of doing that. So um, we'll look into that calibration of the speedo. It may well be already done and, and work, but we'll see. We'll run it up and have a look. But if I do keep this speedo here, all we've got to do is, is clean, uh, repaint the, the needle. It, they don't come off, so we have to do it in situ. So we'll put some card behind it so not to get any paint on the dial face. And we'll change the speedo reading to match what it was when Bramble pulled up. Or we set it on all the zeros. We have to make a decision on that, what you think is best. So before I close for this evening, because it's approaching 8 o'clock, I shall now strip out the gauges from this backing piece. We're going to use this one because it's Bramble's original. Put the clock on the bench and then I'm going to get an in for some dinner. We'll resume tomorrow. So I'll strip this down now. So I'm back again and speaking of, of gauges and modifications, here's a little idea that I had early on in the project and it was to create a dial uh, indicator that wasn't a, a lamp and this was to tell me when the cooling fan is active on the front of the car. I'm fitting a Kenlo fan to the car and I don't want a lamp, a lamp coming on to tell me, I want to know when the fan's running. Okay, <clears throat> that'll just give me extra guidance, uh, extra information about the car behaviour. But I didn't want a bulb um, showing up because it would annoy me flashing away all the time. I wanted something which was an indicator but was, was very subtle. Um, and I got the idea from a Vulcan bomber, would you believe, and they're called Doll's Eyes. On a Vulcan bomber, for the pilots, a lot of the indicating panels are done with a little solenoid and a white bar. When a solenoid activates, it pulls a bar, and they're used to line up. They become like a, a line, and the instruments would have... If, all, if you had four of what they call Doll's Eyes, the lines all go in a line. If the solenoid deactivates, the line spring on the solenoid allows the line to flip the wrong way and you don't get a join and the pilot can spot things quite easily and at night time flying you don't have these lights flashing at you but you've got these sort of um, a physical representation of what's going on so with that inspiration I've come up with this idea for me fan indicator a hole in the clock is already active here but I won't be using that hole it's just it's just a, this is just a mock-up but I have to drill another hole in the clock face okay which isn't a big deal and what you do is you just have this little solenoid at the back if it'll fit this might not fit I'm gonna have to just see and this is only a mock-up by the way it's only just an idea when I was brainstorming and this, this little relay that I've adapted there just put in I've just glued on some cut up zip tie would you believe and a piece of card and you can see when the relay activates the arm pulls in and moves that piece of card right but on that card is a picture of a little miniature fan taken from a logo off the heater blower control face here, copied from that and a sticker made by Mark. And when the relay pulls in, if you can just see, you'll see a little logo of a fan pop up there into view. Let's just activate the relay. There we go. Can you see that popping into view? That would tell me the fan's on. It's not going to annoy me. You won't even notice, but you could look at a glance and see what was actually going on. It's just a little nice little retro piece of information. Coming in a little bit closer for you. Difficult again on autofocus, but you can see it dropping in and out. There's an idea, may may or may not pursue that, but I like it. There we go, look. There is your fan running indicator without being an annoying flashing light okay a little modification we'll think about that if we're going to use it or not let's strip everything down okay little 7mm nut spinner to begin taking these off clock still ticking never been out before I don't think the clocks just stopped that's just because not because I've just undone these but just because it's run out of springy let's 
Let's get the clock out first. Little brass nuts and some washers on there. Washers seized on. Brass nuts won't stick to my magnetic tray. Don't know why I got a magnetic tray when they're brass nuts. Okay, we'll pick off the washers. They'll be locked on a little bit. This one's okay. This one. That one just have to pull out when we do the pull the clock, withdraw the clock. There's your little circuit board, very fragile. Gotta watch those. It's already damaged, you can see it's been repaired here. That's all damaged. Well it's lifting away and burned. These little printed circuit boards are troublesome. Say if printed circuit board's more of a ribbon type thing. Withdraw the clock from the front. What out for that? That's well stuck on that uh, little washer. There's the clock out. Let's have a look now. Still got its seal. I think that's a seal. Uh, we've got a date on it. 25th of the 11th, 71, I think. Going to come in and read that out. Okay, so our clock in Bramble, 25th. It looks like 25th, 11.71, which is strange. Yeah, it could be right, because Bramble's a 72 car. I'm going to say that that's, you'll not see it, but it's got a little date stamp on there. Quite accurately stamped, of course, to the exact day, curiously. There'll be a reason for that, no doubt. Internally, it looks good. Let's see if I can get you on the magnifier so we can see inside a clock itself. Bring the magnifier up to your screen. I'm just hooked over the back of the tripod watching you, watching me, and trying to see if indeed I can get you a bit of a better magnification without using the zoom. There you go. So you can so slowly rotate this so we can see how a Ford Cortina GXL clock looks. In fact, I think XL have a clock too. I just don't have a rev counter. I better be right about that. So there it is. It looks good and we're going to inspect the contacts to see if they're burnt at all and we know what we're up against. I'm just going to rotate it till I can find the set of electrical contacts. There they are, just under the flywheel. So I'm going to try and point them out to you, hopefully. You can see them. They are just under that weight that bobbin flywheel weight just underneath is a set of contacts and they're what burn out so i have to look even closer can't quite do it while you're with me on the camera but they're there they look all right initially and we'll now reconnect this to the power supply in fact why not bring it across while you're on the leads on my power supply are long enough to reach across if i um ravel them it's just in a neat little circular bunch to keep them off the table but if i undo the circular bunch look or rather they're coiled up uncoil them and bring them in you might be able to see this energize you've got some reflective light on there i'm looking at what you're seeing i'll try it for you going for it now you can have a listen if you want I know we've got the radio on in the background as well, but hopefully you can hear that lovely sound. Very hypnotic, very soothing. Okay. We can inspect the dial face now, the clock face, and see if there's any blemishes on it. It looks good to me. That's in good order. So that's a big, big bonus for us that it's not rusted. Because a lot of the dials had rusted, so a great bonus on the clock. Okay, so we can mark this now that it's Bramble, so that we don't get mixed up. That could easily happen. So a little B for Bramble on the casing. Okay, just written it on with a Sharpie pen, then we know it was Bramble's. So we don't get mixed up. And in fact, I'll do the dial face too with a B. 
just at the back in case that gets separated and lost now taking you away the magnifier and back onto the bench to, to tackle the rev counter then moving the dish with the screws to the far right of the bench power supply leads out of the way bringing you across flipping your screen back so i can see what you can see whilst i'm over here and now we've got four of these holding in the rev counter easily done with a seven mil probably get them with our fingers yes we can so the rev counter will be extracted next then we'll extract the five volt regulator i'll show you that in a sec it's another interesting topic how the five volt regulator works i'll talk you through how a five volt regulator works and the principle of the whole thing with the gauges in terms of keeping the gauges stable and not drifting all over the place we'll talk about that later right slowly extracting now let's have a look anything else holding that in no it's just simply a little bit of corrosion on it and it should withdraw there's nothing to stop it withdrawing looking at the back going to hold it a little bit there we go out it comes so here we have the rev counter no date on that one smith's industries made this one Okay, so that's a Smith's gauge, and here's those troublesome little coloured discs. There, just need the sellotape re remaking on that, and then a disc cleaning with just some. Um, I think I think I used WD-40 just to clean the, these off. Face of the rev counter, bringing in the magnifier again to inspect that face. Checking to see if you can see what I can see. Moving it into position for you looking on the side for me cobweb on it the orange has become yellow with time but we'll mask that and paint it back in we've got day glow orange paint we'll, we'll satin black the needle as we said the face is perfect Un, untouched so that's another good unit so again marking up b for bramble b for bramble on the back now marked there we are. Hope that, hope you two didn't pick that radio up. Queen are playing at the moment. We are the champions in the background. I usually have the radio completely off, but uh, just didn't think I'd be filming. I didn't think I'd even be starting this. Whoa! Hey! The light keeps falling back in front of the thing, back of the, in front of your thing. Here's a little rubber cups which direct the lamp, to the light into the appropriate indicator in this case high beam and left indicate now some early uh, dashboards um early the very first few production maybe the first six months had the time clock on the left early k's um to mid k reg cars early k reg cars the time clock was this side would you believe and due to customer complaints they moved it because the rev counter was was on on the right and the clock was on the left and then subsequently later cars all the way up till it became the facelift they uh, had the the rev counter on this side because it was it was deemed the more important gauge and not only that but customer reports and feedback from ford said that you couldn't get your hands in to adjust the clock this is in motor magazine where i've read this and it, in, it actually transpires it's correct because uh, I can't adjust the clock very easily on Swampy, whose clues adjuster is right by the steering cowling, so they swap them around and it's easier to adjust the time with the clock on this side. And the rev gauge is a bit easier visible. The, the time clock tended to dominate the dash when it wasn't as important as knowing your revs right in front of you, I think, anyway. So that's that. And um, we've got now just the back in plastic. We take off these cups these can these can break down with the heat and um, lose their effectiveness that that's a little brittle that one we may soften up we can get some um, rubber food on these which will make the rubber more supple so that the cup is a better fit to the face rear face of the dial they come off they've come off all right so we can just put some food on these and let them supple up a little bit we'll pick the right 
I've got some grease which is um, silicon food that just soft, softens up and stops it from going brittle so we'll, we'll treat those now we need to get the ribbon off here and the voltage regulator here's the voltage regulator there and what that does is it's it's a bimetallic strip so that's um two pieces of metal sandwiched together when they're heated they bend by the nature of expansion on different metals causes them to bend if you have two metals sandwiched together and you heat it up one expands quicker than the other and so it makes the metal bend there's one of them inside there with a little wire coil around that heats it up as as the wire coil heats it up the metal bends and breaks the contact of the actual heating coil so then it begins to get cold again and as it lands because it's now contracting as it's cooling makes contact again with the heater coil heats itself up makes it bend which then breaks the contact so what you get inside here is, is off on off on as it heats up cools down and it goes through its own little cycle of basically like a flasher unit almost and just goes off and on what happens is when it's going off and on it's this this unit supplies the voltage to the uh, temperature and the fuel gauge and what happens is the fuel gauges themselves work by the same principle of bimetallic strip bending which causes a needle to move well what you wouldn't want to happen is when you go over a bump um, your gauge to be wandering all over the place although it would be slow because the bimetallic gauges the fuel and the temperature it's still they can still move pretty quick if they want this creates a sort of half cycle of power in other words they never all they've never got 12 volts it's it's pulses of 12 like this just ticking at the gauge so the gauge never really has time to wander around in a big way it, it requires a sort of um it, this gives it a sort of more slow movement and regulates the electricity to the gauge so that it, it can never really fly about it requires this to keep pulsing it now you think that might make the gauge jump like that but because the bimetallic strip takes a while to cool it doesn't actually pulse it just wanders a little bit like this but it will stabilize wherever the temperature probe on the engine or the fuel sender in the tank is sat at so it's, it never really moves around it just stays there and this just constantly gives it a little burst of, of power and that smooths it out the operation that's a voltage regulator um, you, you can say well does it actually create 5 volts it doesn't it doesn't create 5 volts that some later ones were replaced with units that were a 5 volt regulator um, and these were, were taken out from a different system although it was in the same footprint and shape and it, you can actually retrofit them so we want to take that out it requires a Phillips screwdriver take that out and then I'll remove the ribbon here's your your bulbs we could get them out as well and then everything's going in the dishwasher and I'm knocking off for the night okay nearly stripped down I'll just take the regulator off okay. into the little parts tray for that this should now extract it's probably oh there you go whoa it's gone on the floor and I've just knocked over the rev counter wow oh my god get that rev counter somewhere safe and get them bubble wrapped Right, sorry, that flew off. It's okay. It's tough little units. Five volt. Well, no, not five volt, but gauge regulator. There you have it. Just two pins and an earth. It has the earth on the casing for it to work. Okay, one side of the heating coil is connected to the earth. The other side's 12 volts in. And the other pin is off, on, off, on, off, on. Quite slow about. Tick, tick, tick tick so what's that one one hertz about one hertz once a second hertz is the amount of times per second if anyone ever says to you 50 hertz it's 50 cycles a second so this is one cycle a second so this would be a one hertz output it might not be one and i reckon they vary as they get older as well they'll probably change but never know i've never actually known one fail but i've heard that they can fail i've never seen one and you know it just goes to show that that can be 40 years old no 50 1971 so hang on a minute we are because we've come up to the 50th anniversary of the cortina in 2020 
nearly 50 years old piece of kit still working I mean yes you could argue that the car was off the road for all most of that time so it was actually sat idle that is that is possibly true what did confuse me about Bramble is that the mileage was on 90,000 but it didn't reflect that in 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 the uh, in the car I don't know why there's something that told me oh the clock itself I don't know if there was things that uh, I thought, is it really a 90,000 mile car? I don't know, it didn't, didn't look like it was. But so it could have been motorway miles. Here we have now a little circuit board, a little ribbon circuit board, and that just detaches. It's a bit damaged, that one. But we could still salvage it. We have got one more available on the back of this set, which is a lot better. That's not damaged or burned in any way. So we have got a good one there. Okay, on that set of gauges there. So now we have a piece of plastic. Just wants the little washer tapping off. Um, so that'll, otherwise that's going to end up in the dishwasher. There is a washer stuck on it there. Going to knock that off, off screen. You wouldn't think something like that would be so hard to... Attached. There it goes. I just leave it by putting the screwdriver inside the washer and levering it out. Put that into the tray. That is magnetic. And now we have the two pieces of plastic which I need for tonight's fun activity in the kitchen. Let's get these really nice and clean now and begin this lovely process of building this um, pod console, centre clocks, and get them looking nice. So. The plexiglass was already off. You can see how they cracked over time. Common area was around this part, and this one is, is, is shows the classic sign of the cracked, fractured perspex a little bit there. No, it's only that area. This one's actually not that bad. There's some scratches on it though. So, but that's it's no good. So it's not bad. It hasn't gone in other areas, but it's bad in this area. So this, but you can get these. Someone's remaking them. Would you believe? On eBay so you can get new they're not quite as good on the moldings around the adjusters that tend to be drilled out holes they've not pressed it in but they've not done a bad job they've even put this part code into it why they didn't actually mold these they make the hole but they don't make the molding I don't know why but you need a good plexiglass you're gonna do all that work and then not have a decent um, plexi on the front perspex on the front you need to do that okay so it's dishwasher time and um, it's a whole few minutes for you and a whole day for me as I begin to tire over and out for this section we'll jump straight into the morning's work we'll see you in in a sec okay we're back there's our little time warp just seconds ago I went off well, eight seconds ago for me, we know this, we say this every time, <laughs> don't we? But it's the next day, and I left the clock ticking. But when I shut the camera off, I um, noticed the clock stopped, and it hadn't stopped because of those contacts. Well, it had once, actually, the contacts, I've looked at the contacts on Bramble's original clock. Contacts are, or were, a little bit... Um, what would you say, corroded, burned, and also, even when it did charge, the clock would freeze. So, I'm going to show you. I've got it going. It's losing time, but it is. It has run all through the night without freezing up. So, here it is. Still going. Let's get the lights on it. There, still going, but losing time. We've lost 10 minutes in about uh, 18 hours or whatever it is maybe less hang on a sec eight o'clock it's gone eight for 12 hours it's now coming up to one uh, eight for 12 uh, eight nine ten eleven twelve twelve yeah 17 17 hours it's lost 10 minutes so this one's losing time but at least it's ticking and not freezing up anymore and i'm going to show you what i did to unfreeze it We've got a breaker here, breaker breaker one nine a copy, breaker one nine a copy. 
this is not so much well it is a brake it's damaged um, a spring has come off this inside and it just doesn't want to hook back on but this is a, a chassis out of a clock out of the same type of clock and with this we can use it to demonstrate to you those, that contact repair that we do which is the main fault on these clocks the set of contacts but also if you're getting one that just occasionally freezes up and you have to tap it to get it going and if it's not the contacts the works themselves there must be something in there that jams up so what I've done with brambles and it seems to have carried on going it's off the power supply at the moment so you can't hear it ticking it's, it's gone uh, some solvent cleaner and I've just absolutely drenched it now this stuff evaporates off and leaves no residue but it should take off any anything that might have gummed it up or corroded it up or dusted it up that went on to Bramble's clock and also I got a very small file and rubbed the contacts now there will be a technique and I should know it and I don't know why I don't and we used to just drag paper through them with switch cleaner but these contacts were a bit pitted was the word I was looking for so I actually filed them now as I was filing the contacts and we'll show you on this under the lens in a sec it was coming up clean sort of silver underneath so it wasn't taking off it looks like it's a pad a solid pad of the contact and you can you're not taking a coating off it I don't think although some contacts are flash coated there's various techniques with electrical contacts and um, various principles with them but with nothing to lose. I did also come up with an idea whereby we could create, if the contacts were beyond saving, uh, we could. I actually found access to the solenoid here. There's two connections. We're going to take under the um, magnifier and I'll talk you through it there, then it's a little bit better for you to see. So hold on and I'll set you up under the magnifier again for this clock repair rebuild video, dash rebuild video. Welcome. We're halfway through, so welcome. And we're doing a live chat, hopefully, on this one too. It's a premiere! Yeah, okay, over the vents. What's through the round window? Who's going to do some, some Bungle impressions, please? Jeff Rye, I can't do it. Bungle, what's through the round window? Or oh, if you do it, yeah, if you want to do it, a northern version of Play School. Who remembers Play School? Answers on a postcard. Answers in the chat box now, please. See if you're paying attention. Play School. Whoops. My um, little roller seat hit the tripod then. What's fruit? What's fruit? Round window. Okay. You're going to see the coil, the recharging coil just there. Okay. You're going to see me rotate this round to see the armature end. A little paddle, whatever you want to call it, that uh, gets attracted by the magnetic force of the solenoid. This is how it charges it up. And it whacks a little wheel, a flywheel if you will. Here's the flywheel that it, that it hits. This one stuck, because this is the damaged unit. So this flywheel is free to move normally. Let me try and uh, unfree it, I don't know why it's stuck. There it is on its little ratchet. That's why. It looks like this flywheel doesn't want to move. That's the problem with this clock. It's stuck down. Seized. What happens is this armature, there's a set of contacts there. You can just see them. The flywheel puts a loading on the clock. That's the actual uh, sprung movement, the kinetic energy stored in that that just pulls the workings of the clock round and makes it do the ticking noise like this I'm putting the force on now we've got the clock going my screwdrivers doing it so that part of the clock's all right so as that unwinds this these set of contacts come closer and closer together and as it touches this side the coil energizes, pushes against it, 
and throws it back it reaches the end of its stroke there but this inertia carries on going on this flywheel and manages to push further back into the clock mechanism and then creates a loading on the uh, spring which gives you the tick tock and away you go until it runs out of uh, energy again rejoins this contact and then throws it back and that's what makes that lovely clicking sound so the contacts that you need to look at on your clock if it's failed are just down here set of contacts there the file goes in and you're able to clean them now if they're only lightly gummed you just use um, some paper and some cleaning contact cleaner but these were pitted well not this one but brambles this one's our demo clock but it was the same principle on bramble filed and flat okay and that was the end now then if they were beyond repair and completely melted away you could create or I, I could do it and you could get the same part off the shelf hopefully but you could create by soldering across the coil here there there's the two coil winding ends you could actually create a little timer electronic timer external from the clock or you could fit it inside here what's called a triple five timer little tiny chip uh, I'll bring one out of the box and show you if I've got one in stock I should have now I'll keep it on the static mat I've got a few few here coming into view then there's the, these little timer chips they're built they were designed in 1971 would you believe and they form the heart of actually these are LMs but they're similar to this designed in 71 called the uh, the NE triple five and it is the sort of heart of a lot of timing clocks and from that one chip there's four on there you only use one you build a little clock circuit similar to what we did in the wiper motor modules and it would create a pulse you'd have to set the time that you want to do it basically getting the average time it takes for one of these springs to unwind each clock probably unwinds differently before it hits its own contacts and recharges the clock but I would say about a minute and uh, the springs about to need to be recharged if the contacts were damaged you could just have the chip every minute just pulses the solenoid here and you wouldn't need the contacts anymore so it would be a sort of hybrid clock it would be self winding on on the timer circuit and throwing this back and it, you know it might not even be approaching the contacts before it does another pulse and keeps throwing the weight back you wouldn't want it happening too often you'd like to get it probably once every minute throw the weight back then it wouldn't need those contacts anymore okay if yours would be on salvage yes you could if you could really get into it you could take them apart but it looks like one set of contacts is actually built into this flywheel here so if that pad can you just see that pad there I'm hoping you you're focused enough you need keen eyes but let's use the pick because it's got an angle on it okay end of the picks touching one contact face that's on the flywheel and the other side's the armature of the solenoid okay now if they'd coat totally gone it doesn't look like that's serviceable without putting a new flywheel in it so you could be lost and dead in the water and your clock could be gone but with this idea with a timing chip you could get yourself out of jail create a little pulse time clock that just pulses this every minute and it wouldn't need them contacts anymore it just it just throw the flywheel once every minute I think that would work so that's a possibility if if we got stuck uh, brambles contacts seem okay indeed we could uh, maybe look at them through the perspex it's not as easy because it, it reflects the light but brambles clock comes into your view and then the contacts are just on the flywheel face there and I've already cleaned them and it's given it good running so now the only thing to do with this clock is to get it to read the right time and not lose time this could be hit and miss there is that adjuster screw that we talked about and it indicates on the plastic a plus and minus I think no it doesn't so we don't know which way is speed up we don't know which way is slow down but the adjuster screw is here in the end there so we could just go hit and miss and start turning that screw and seeing if we can get the clock to reach good time 
now that we've fixed and ungummed the workings with the solvent spray don't use any oils just use something that evaporates off I used um, IPA solvent and use the nozzle of the solvent the little tube the little straw that comes with it so you could direct it in be careful and wary of the, the coil wound springs you don't want to be blasting them with any pressure because you could damage the fragile fly springs or whatever they're called the little coiled up springs very delicate workings lovely little clocks as I've said on this video and nice to get them going it would be great to get this to keep accurate time so I'm gonna try and tweak it and then we're gonna it's one of them jobs where you're just gonna have to leave it and not much you can do except observe it uh, throughout the course of the next week really and have it ticking away on the bench non-stop it's about the only thing we can do but at least we've investigated the clock situation took the quite easy to take apart you just have to unscrew the, the, the seal the factory seal that sticker there reveals a little tiny screw and that, that allows the mechanism to come out just a couple of little those um, little tiny spire nut washer things that we're always talking about on the end of my finger there you see you've got to hook them out two of them on the front plastic casing this part is held in and then but the whole thing comes to pieces and indeed on this you can see the broken shaft of the clock adjuster at the end of that shaft the sprung ends good and the little white wheel but at the end there where you you would grab it with your fingers to adjust the time in the dashboard they snap off and this one is broke so we need to find a clock that we can substitute in because brambles is also snapped off and you wouldn't be able to have your adjuster knob here to pull out and turn the time because the threads have snapped and that was, that's a common problem as you try and undo the screw which holds the knob on inevitably the screw is seized onto these threads here and the knob just shears and that's what's happened on this one too I didn't do it, it was already broke when the car was found but all in all we've done some good investigation with the clock and we could now uh, leave it running and start to trim trim the time in as I say I don't know which way is fast forward on the clock and rewind although you may be able to reverse engineer how they've done it looking at the clock adjusting shaft this is it here goes into the workings and is a brass if you look you can see a brass rod coming in which is the end of the screw and it touches a sort of p-clip shape metal piece of metal which must I just can't quite work out how it's doing it by rotating that it's obviously doing something to advance the time or delay the time so we need to just have a closer look at how the clock system works I could do some googling perhaps but that's it not really much to it I wouldn't say it's the most accurate timepiece in the world just looking at the the amount of movement that it's got I would say it um, doesn't seem finely engineered it's not bad but it's very basic even some wind up clocks that you get on the mantelpiece have got more cogs in them than these so to me just by the sheer amount of cogs and movement in it but it's probably not a precision time piece and probably was never intended it to be but I must say that Ruby's clock does not lose time or gain time it stays bang on so if I can get it anywhere near that I'll be happy okay that's the end of, uh, end of the magnification part hopefully that was clear well lit and in focus for you at home and that you can see a Cortina movement clock there'll be a name for this I don't know if it's called a movement when it, you've got this complete chassis body here would have a name in clock terms but there it is this one damaged because the flywheel seized I could fix it perhaps there's a spring missing here that's broke in fact I think that's what happened this spring spring just where my thumbnails touching is snapped and that's what broke that clock never had that happen before they mostly just seize up and I have had quite a few that where the contacts have been good but they just stop halfway through and then you tap them and they start working and that seems to be solved by blasting them with the IPA solvent it could be that uh, one of the very fine springs perhaps gums up on its shaft so it's got too much force 
and that the IPA solvent is fixing that fault. Enough of that, we'll move on to the rest of the dashboard build now, but that was the clock part of it. A little bit of interest, I think clocks have always interested me, I don't know about you, I found them fascinating, um, much more fun and much more enjoyable to look at than a digital clock or even a quartz clock, there's just something about the amazing engineering of all those wheels and the design that went into this. I mean obviously it would have been, this is probably an off the shelf design that they brought in the clock manufacturer and just evolved over time. There'll be basic principles involved with this, certain wheel sizes, certain sprung, spring sprung, there's the coily spring, I can just see it there, there's a name for that spring, is it a helical spring, touching it now, it's your classic watch type spring, the back of it there with its electrical contacts, that's one of the contacts that when you push it into the case, makes contact so it's in your dash, the power can flow through it, I'm not sure which is pos and neg but power's on one of them and I think it's on that one so that is it markings on the back then what do we see we've got some letters on there uh, Kenzel 317A we could google that and see if it pulls any results back be very interesting my hands aren't as steady as they used to be stay still a Kenzel it could be a Kenzel 617A It'd be very interesting to google that up I mean, i'd love to get into the history of this to see how it was made how it works there may be some information out there for that kenzel kenzel please tell me i'm pronouncing that correct interesting watchmaking interesting subject i bet there's a lot of stuff on youtube about that as i promised we're moving on the rest of the dash build we've got a we've got a dishwasher to run We've got some plastics to put in it. We've got some dial faces to clean. We've got a speedo to set up. There's plenty to do in this dashboard build, this tech semi-tech video. Hopefully, with different angles, it won't be too boring. If I left the camera just there, perhaps it wouldn't be as interesting to watch. You'd only be listening to me, and you know I can talk forever. Let's move on. Before I move on to the um, the rest of the, the clocks, I want to show you something. A little bit of entertainment for you. This dashboard, this pod cluster I've got here, this binnacle, is out of an XL. If you look back on the uh, channel videos, I think it's XL Recovery. It's a green XL. I think it's Fern Green XL that we, uh, that unfortunately was so rotten that it got broke up, and I, I bought a lot of parts off it from Dave.com, the car recovery guy. I videoed it. It is on there on the channel and uh, it was absolutely mint car when it got parked up you could tell look at on it i think it's xl recovery it was a mint car when it got parked up with only 16,000 miles on it i know they were right the car had been put in this garage and it was unbelievable it just whatever garage it was you think it was a concrete lockup or it had been flooded gone underwater or it was just so damp the car just dissolved and it was such a shame because you could see wherever the paint was undamaged it was absolutely mint fern green metallic paint and the car was just low mileage untouched everything all the original hoses all the original clips even the stickers were still on the radiator hoses the ford stickers were still on there and we, we filmed that but i got a lot of parts of it and it was that rotten you just just crawl everything just the foot everything there was just nothing left it was such a shame and i got the binnacle out this is it and this is how much i mean you you tell me if you think this has been underwater or it's just so damp but look at this if we have to try and repair this let's get the light on so you can see this is interesting this keep I'll give you a little bit of a commercial break i've run some adverts but i don't want to get copyrighted look at this and again, we thank Chilsh for reminding us to bring stuff to the camera. Don't shake around. That's such a great tip, and I'm so appreciative of that. Sometimes it's uh, the ego gets in the way when you know if someone they don't criticise and hardly ever get criticism as such. But constructive advice, um, constructive advice 
is what you want and that's what you want out of YouTube okay that's what it's great for because you reach and I'm reaching 20,000 people and the odds are statistics will say that X amount of you are mechanics X amount of watchmakers X amount of electronics engineers uh, pop stars um, everyone out there with all your skills that we've all got and your valuable time that you spend with me which I appreciate but all those skills they're all out there and you're watching and I have to learn as I go along so if someone says to me you know uh, use a copper hammer when you're knocking the bolt through the suspension clip I know I didn't do it that was because the bolt went through dead easy however that's not the point I should have um, engaged in good practice whenever you knock a bolt use a soft face hammer not a, not a bolt point pain so things like that you've got to accept that people are trying to help even if the comment comes across and it, it depends how your brain filters these things of course and uh, our brains can filter a statement in different ways it, it, this often happens you, it will happen to you you read a text message and it could it could look hostile or it could be completely friendly and innocent because you lose the inflection with it just being typed out on a text so that has to be um, bear in born in mind if you're on YouTube like I am or if you're doing your channel your new channel when these comments come in take them on board and don't let the ego get in the way your ego is not your friend it's a pain now if you talk about ego and we've all got it um, you have to learn to place it to one side accept the criticism or the constructive remarks put your ego over there because it's only going to get in the way and then here's a good part if you take on board advice from your mentors and everyone needs mentors everyone should have mentors there's no one out there who's the best everybody needs guidance everybody needs someone to help them all successful people have had mentors along the way as they've, as they've um, you know they've achieved the goals that they want in life a mentors there to help and in my case, my mentors are on YouTube, so they're there to help. And even if one of the comments is obviously having a go at you, it doesn't really matter. It's still a mentor; they're still helping because they might. You might think, "Bugger off," you know, and then you think at the back of your mind, you think, "Actually, he's right. I, just, I can't take it because of my ego." So drop that ego out of the way. Then, once you've done that, and you've, you've engage in good practice and you've learned and it's all about that learning you move on up and then you've learned and that little lesson's been great and then you can get the ego and put it back and then it, it's it's all handy again you know because you can um, reap your rewards you know all all good stuff has to be earned you never really get any any sort of um you never really get any uh, a glory or appreciation if it's not earned everything is hard work there's no quick way to the top but learning 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 and don't let the ego get in the way put it to one side bring it back when you when you're ready for it and then it, it's not too bad okay so we totally totally went off on the ramp ramble ramble everyone wants the bramble rambles look at this clock then come on you're dying to see it all that time Okay, so the XL, have we got reflections on it? Let's see if we can just knock the reflections out. I don't know if we can, so that you don't get the reflections, but you've just got the light from it's picking up. So let's bring you in. So chill, thanks for that. In you go, and look at the corrosion on this. I mean, if I took the perspex off, we'll see it even more. That is wow. You know, and this clock, that's C, that's got to be C solid. Should we just, for a bit of fun, open it up and try and get the clock to fire? Should we see if it's, if, should we see if the, uh, should we see if the, all the corrosion on this XL clock has got in, uh, XL dash pod has got into the time clock? And just see for a bit of fun. And then we did that late night uh, radio film. Everyone seemed to love that too. Isn't this a little bit of fun? You can join me, pretend you're here with me in the workshop and it was one of the things on a Sunday afternoon oh, let's just see if this uh, wonder if that would ever work again type thing you know because the time's on our side today get it? right so let's just let's have a quick 
well first we'll put some power see the thing is I can't the power's running the clock now uh, um, um, power's running the clock don't want to interrupt the clock because it's on time check we really need to have an alternate power supply for the clock and put it off the bench out of the way I have got an alternate power supply it's over there I think we should rig it up and uh, because the other leads for the 12 volt are, are running my um, mp3 which I've got on in the background we're now on Marillion's Brave album right pan and tilt and you go over and round but we shall start the clip again I can't see you I can see you right I'm going to set you up so you're in a better camera angle and we can now put the main lights on in the workshop and turn them off for reflections setting you up other angle coming up we're going to have a little bit of fun just a little 10 minute break and try and fire the clock up on these XL clocks this 18 16,000 miler that got parked and then just dissolved okay join me on the bench PC called Tina City you bought your t-shirts yeah have a look on the shop just under the uh, video a t-shirt shop and I'm not even wearing one great advert that is <laughs> right these screws are gonna be seeds if you just joined us if you're skipping naughty 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 skipping then I'm just having a little we're having a little break us youtubers patreons and live chat people and we're taking apart some XL clocks which were mega seized and mega water damaged and we're going to take a close look at the inside I'm taking the perspex off and straight away the radio knob is seized solid which is going to obstruct our ability to get into this perspex because I mean, and curiously we may have on our hands here oh no this perspex is no good I was going to say we may have on our hands a good perspex we could use on our clocks but because XLs didn't have the mylometer reset switch there's no hole in the perspex so you could drill it but I'm not going to because you can get them on eBay so uh, the center knob comes off by turning this but I'm, it's a pound to a penny that will be gone and seized into the shaft which is why then shafts snap I really don't know if we can do this in order to save you time and may jump you ahead that screw there is crudded up we're gonna have to just get some locking pliers on it and take it off this adjuster knob whilst I've got my watchmaker in it that little grub screw will be seized on they're hard to find them grub screws it would be nice to try and salvage that but I don't really know how we can we can do it uh, the odds are it will snap um, don't really know it would be nice to save it because they're a rare item I'm trying to think how I could undo that grub screw, but I just really don't think it's going to happen. Is there any other way we can do it? We could break it out of the perspex, but then it would damage the perspex, which is such a criminal shame. I can't do that either. So I've got to think of a way. I mean, the only way is it for it to break. Then get another shaft for a clock, which just there's no way I can think of doing it. They're penetrating fluid is just never going to get in there we can't pull it out everything is seized even the movement of the clock seized I'm so dying to see inside that clock to see what's actually creating it and, and if it will fire up if it's only a 16,000 mile car then it wouldn't have had much use would it but this is one of those things like what's in the trunk type situation you want to know what's behind the dials you know what's all the damage behind the dials and that's what we're trying to do Mm, trying to think let me pause the film I ever think because otherwise we're just going to be hours and hours okay most of the screws are out some needed the pliers on them to get them very very rusty back where we where we where we rusted back screws the heads have gone a lot of these so even the dashboard screws themselves are absolutely gone that's that this will separate out a little bit crusty of course there we go so we're first time out it looks like it's been underwater there's more tide marks it's got to have been or has it 
yeah I don't know what do you think is it looking like something that's been under the water what happened to this car scroll back scroll back through the films and find the XL green one there's also XL forensic autopsy film that I did XL autopsy might get it the film for you XL autopsy it's on there it's in me it's in my video links it's in my video uploads okay so yeah better view wow look at that corrosion look at that it's attacked that I bet even the actual temperature gauges and everything are just seized at all the movement or would they go no actually they may actually work no that's actually managed to something actually attack that and actually detach the the needle I'm not saying it couldn't be fixed but look at the state of this in a plate the state of the plate nothing couldn't uh, nothing beyond repair though that could all be repaired it could all be fixed to be quite a nice rewarding thing to actually restore this back to a lovely dial and you can see that blue again curiously this time only around the the area of the uh, speedo we're interested in the clock so let's detach the clock we've got our nut spinner it's a seven mil just off screen so for you we're going in grab this and do these get this clock out as it tries to rotate the, the uh, circuit board clock's loose let's see what we've got because this is a, a clock rebuild film so I just wish I could have saved the adjustment shaft whoops Could get them re-engineered perhaps. Oh the nut gone, I must remember to get that. Okay. Withdraw. Something just holding it. Probably a washer. Yeah, it is. There we go. Washers have a habit of seizing on. Circuit board's losing its top laminate, but it's still there. And now, and now. And you've got a little interesting snippet of info coming up as well. We'll take put the rest of the instrument panel off screen, away off screen. Let's just concentrate on the clock in this part of the film. There it is. I've not seen the back of it yet. Going under my magnifier. Clock face damaged. Rotate round. Has the corrosion got inside? Have we got a date that's readable? No, we've got some letters on there. H and a one. You can tell now it's low mileage because the green coloured discs I was telling you about earlier haven't the sellotape hasn't crinkled showing the bulb usage is low. So that reflects the low mileage too. Corrosion inside the armature I can see straight away. The adjustment shaft is jammed. The clock adjuster shaft is jammed, well seized in, but curiously it's not corroded like the others, it's got the chrome finish on it, so they weren't black after all, the adjustment clock shaft is chrome, there's a turn up, it hasn't been apart, the seal is still intact, looking for a date then 
too faded to read any date stamp on that. No. Looking under the microscope, corrosion on the armature metal. And it stopped in the stopped in the unwound position, so it was running and then jammed itself short. Contacts are joined and closed. So I would imagine applying power to it would attempt to fire it up. The shaft being stuck won't interfere with the movement. We still, the second hand is free. Okay, so we're going to apply power now, different camera angle for you. You join us, you join us live as we get the live cables and connect up to the clock. Let's see if we get anything. Just trying to remember which one's power. Power is looking at this one. I always forget because the three terminals not all are used. The one nearest the adjuster is not used, therefore. Okay, let's see if it fires up. I think we did try it on the cluster. I think I did, but it, and it didn't go. But different now, it's out. Nothing. It's sparking. Drawing currents. That means if I leave it on too long, it will burn the clock out. So it doesn't want to go. We could try tapping it. Just watching the amp gauge to see. Yeah, it's drawing because it's. I don't know if you can see that, but it's, it's, it's sparking there. So the coil is energised, but the armature must be seized down. So it's trying to pull in and knock the counterweight, the flywheel weight back, but it can't do it. So the contacts are making. So we'll take off the... Carefully try and take this off. Luckily that came off. These may be seized on. I think they are. Okay, needles, indicators are off. Flip these little tabs and the face comes out. Face off. And then we've got two those spire nuts to pop off. A screw to undo at the back to withdraw the mechanism out. So I'm going to do that now, freeze you, and we'll get this stripped open. Okay, I'm into the clock. It was a little bit seized, one of the little grub screws that holds that metal tang would seize solid in, so I had to drill it, <clears throat> but we're in. And now we can have a look to see that relay, the armature that fires the counterweight, looks corroded there. That should be pushing in and it's not, so that's lost its sort of, it'll be, it'll be seized on the fulcrum point, I would have thought around that area so we're gonna to have to unseize that it could be some penetrating oil on it now and see what okay we seem to have tracked down the fault on this there's an armature just here that's that the uh, solenoid armature is seized and I think that between the coil windings and the actual armature flap itself it's built up some crud and the lever won't energize and pull down. I managed to just wiggle it free on the fulcrum point but it's not compressing, it's not drawing itself into the solenoid. I think it's got a load of muck underneath the arm and it can't compress. It needs to be taken off so we can probably get in just on this nut and may be able to. I've got one eye open so I can focus because you tend to when you're using the magnifier lose coordination a little bit this needs to come up and if it needs to come off it's coming loose there now 
see the armature moving it should go up and down and it doesn't it's going left to right a little bit as it wobbles but it isn't going up and down so something's jamming that it's not springing up and down it's seized, seized solid I think it slides out I'm certainly getting looser we'll only give this so much time then we'll we might have to write it off it was an interesting bit of fun but can we save the clock I don't know depends if I can get to all these parts there we go that's up now what's holding that something on it there and get it enough to get this out this armature out and inspect the armature it's enough to get it out if we can hook under it it's an electrical contact it's copper it's a copper bar yes it's the electrical contact this because it goes to the resistor that's soldered onto the resistor there hope you can still see I've got to lift this up should be okay just bending that back slightly I've got to withdraw this out there we go it's off hook that come on come on out can we save the clock come on you can do it Can we save Gary's Excel clock? Yes. Hook a duck, here we go. The armature is out. Now we can see the top of the, the coil, and indeed, there it is the top of the armature's crudded up so it can't push down. We need to get that cleaned up nail file on that clean the face of this you can see that the energized part that's the magnetic part of the coil it's all corroded so we didn't get any movement on it so we clean those two up and put that back we might be in with a chance nail file in voice going come on voice hold out loads of crud on there that should be nice and shiny really that it's copper and things have oxidized and I see green there should go back to copper so the copper face has oxidized or corroded away giving no clearance to operate the actual leverage this should do it I do not rate these cheapo nail files I've got here We're obviously gonna have to blow this crud out we don't want it in the mechanism I, I know about that really shouldn't be anywhere near it, it really is eroded wow what was going on in this car to do all this damage it's like an acidic environment that the car was in to attack the metals in this way I wonder if it was concrete that had leached out of those concrete fence panel things you know and the garage was so damp that the concrete started leaching in and becoming acidic or alkali rather I think it would be heavy alkalis 
as opposed to acid base. Let's get a pick in there. Do you know what? I can't find my circuit board little mini scrubber. I've got a little wire scrubber. Scrubbers! Yeah, there's a raised bit there, which is the problem. Dremel might do it, but it's a bit aggressive. I'll get a little wire brush on a Dremel, perhaps. Anyway, I'm going to carry on cleaning this armature face. Or this uh, solenoid. I don't think that's the yolk of the uh, solenoid. And then I'll clean this up. It's a bit, this will be a bit easier. And there's our contact as well, showing that we could replace one side at least. Contact showing to be in good order nice and silver no flash marks or burn marks on those right I'll continue with that and then we'll, we'll reassemble hopefully it'll work so I've just taken the top off the little solenoid here and that's the arm which flies back and charges the clock up and in the same time makes electrical contact pushes the, the bobbin away the inertia of the bobbin continues going and this flips back being de-energized hold on let's see. just cleaning up the arm to show the best I can it's the, uh, the center of the coil it will not be copper it will be iron because copper is not magnetic so I made a mistake the shaft that I just cleaned up on the face, see the yoke is iron for magnetism, not copper. Before anyone wanted to point that out, this is actually quite badly pitted, it's actually et into it. The file won't do it. It's like pitted, so I'm digging it out. The whole thing's pretty bad, to be fair. And these little bits of iron can fall inside the working, so this would be an unreliable unit, I think. That's cleaned up. I'm going to blow some air through that. I'm going to reassemble the face of the yoke. It's scratched clean. You see it just here. So we should go back together. Let's try it. And here's that contact. That's one of the electrical contacts there. So I'll give you a chance to show you that electrical contact. See if it will uh, show up here for you. Doubt it. Let's try the hand trick. electrical contact just there and that's the remains of the armature going back in well we're all back together this is a moment of truth the contacts have landed the clock is ticking as you just saw there we had to replace I'm sorry, I just had to go and change my flashcard, so I probably got interrupted just at the end of that last clip. I'm probably, my voice just cut off, sorry about that. The, the um, SD card filled up and we had uh, no recording space left. So, I had to change this armature. It just wouldn't work with it in. So we've pinched one off the breaker, because we know we had a, a chassis spare. So we've pinched the armature off that, so into that clock. It's now ticking and recharging itself as it should and it's uh, continued to go what I did do is freed the hands mechanism up this little bit just here a um, little bit of oil in there and then spun it round a few times because what I find is they can bind on those and then that stalls the clock because what was happening this had started to go then it was stalling and I found that now it doesn't stall anymore because I've just freed up the the movement 
um, Bramble's clock is still ticking and I've now readjusted it to see if it's holding the time. So I've trimmed backwards on it. Uh, 19.36 on the clock on the wall, which is what I've used. 19.36, this is now holding time. We're now, we are now holding time on this clock here. It's 19.36 on the wall and it's 19.36 on Bramble's clock. So it's reverse, it's anti-clockwise on the adjustment screw to increase the time. So clockwise on the adjustment screw decreases the time. So this is now held out. That's been three, three hours, three and a half hours, and it's not lost any time over three and a half hours, but that's early days yet. So that can go over there but this one's ticking away and charging in fact it's coming up to a charging cycle now keep your eyes on this area just here as they touch those contacts and it throws the bobbin or flywheel ping out it goes this one runs a lot quieter than Bramble's clock very very quiet running unit this is. I actually like the noisier clock. Now why it's quieter I don't know. Could it, be, could it be a lower mileage clock? Just don't know. In terms of mileage there's no guarantee that the clock hasn't done anything if it's come off a low mileage car but it, it would indicate that it would be but you could have had a, a car that's uh, um, you know been parked up for 50 years and the clock still ticks regardless of the mileage. It could have 100 miles on the car. You could have a car that's 98,000 miles, that's 50 years old. It's the age of the car particularly and how long the battery's been connected. So just because it's a low mileage car doesn't necessarily mean that the clock will have been low mileage because the clock starts ticking the day the car is made. Unless you have your car laid up with no battery on. So there's never a real indication that this clock would be low mileage, although it does look good. Um, you know the, the uh, contacts. Yeah, we'll come up to another cycle. Tick and away it goes. So that's the end of that. We're going to put the clock face on it now, and we're going to leave two clocks running overnight, and just see if the um, if this one keeps time as good as the other. Brambles may lose time overnight. Who knows? That's what the testing's all about. So I'm going to move on to another job. We've spent a lot of time messing around with these clocks, haven't we? But we've learned a lot as we've gone along. Let's reassemble this now, put it back in its casing, and um, we can put them side by side, the two clocks. Let's do that next and look at them side by side on the bench. Here we go. Okay, this one is back together. I've set the time on it. And we're going to see if our repaired clock keeps time. If it doesn't, we'll try and trim it in. You may hear other ticking noises. It's a clock bonanza. It's a... Uh, wow, it's time by Pink Floyd. Yes. Come on in and have a little look. And have a listen. The sweet sound of the Mark III XL and GXL time clocks. Can you tell the difference? There is a difference. The XL clock is a different face. Smaller radius in a circle. And the indicator and alternator light in different positions slightly offset. I never really noticed that, so there is a difference between the clocks even. But look at that for a setup on the bench. Now which one's going to be right? We've checked the time. Let's go over. I'll do it live so you know there's no camera trickery going on. What's he on about camera trickery? Okay, let's have a look at this clock. This is the this is the time clock special. Right, five. Seven minutes past eight. 
Time for tea soon. Seven minutes past eight. We agree in that we're on seven minutes past eight. Five plus the two. Once just once, just bring it a little bit round. That's about right. It's about right. It's about right. So one may gain, one may lose. Brambles is the one that I've tried to adjust in. So so far that's not touched. Unless I just touched it then. I don't know if I did or not. But it, uh, it's been holding the time for a couple of hours, as, as I mentioned. So we'll see. Now, where did the other two clocks come from? Well, I had some spares. And indeed, in this bag, as little collections of stuff over the years. Face needles, spare gauge, spare dials. That one's damaged, but these have come out of storage bins. Not, I've not damaged that. It's like that when I got it. And uh, so, yeah, I've put together the rest of the clocks. Now, I think these two are new old stock clocks. Um, they have got the shaft undamaged, so we've got two good shafts there. This one's a half one off Bramble, and that one off that XL one completely sheared. Interestingly, in chrome, not in matte. I think the factory finish on the XL is satin. So, um, these two will go... Uh, it could be used or I could use that arm off Bramble's clock now how OCD do we want to be do we keep the very fact that it is Bramble's time clock in there or do we just put in a new old stock gauge it's a good question Bramble's would have to be opened up and this shaft removed and the new shaft without the damaged end fitted that's the reason why I think I bought these years ago is because I knew these were tendons and tending to snap so I thought well I'll get these when they came up new old stock Although they were new old stock, they were loose in a box, auto jumble type stuff. And I also have also another face plate in stock, quite a very tidy one actually that's virtually unblemished. How that survived, I don't know, but I've had it in a good packing bag over there. So that's a good face plate. It just goes to show you never know when you might need your bits. So how about that for a clock bonanza as we all typed away on this... Uh, premiere uh, and this um, live chat another tech talk live chat long one this time but that's what you asked for i think there's a certain clique not clique that's wrong clique's no good there's a certain type of techie fan on cortina city and i'm one of them and they just love the tech stuff and that's good i mean i'd, I'd, I'd i could gather together twenty thousand tech only fans and have hardcore techie fans then I could post all the videos I want and everyone would watch at the moment we have a nice mixture of people who like the welding they like the bramble rambles they like the tech stuff some like all three others just like the tech others like don't want tech so I try and cater for everybody and I know we could sit and watch these clocks ticking all day but for now I'm going to call this part one of the uh, dash pod rebuild and refurb and then we'll go into part two because we've spent a lot of time and i'm gonna otherwise i think we would have ended up with a three hour film why not break it into two sections so you're coming to the end of uh, part one of the dash clock rebuild with a particular emphasis on the time clocks as they all tick away there okay we'll give you a little outro to go with it one breaker just in my hand good for spares you never know in my lifetime will I ever use all these clocks it's unlikely these will be passed on to the next generation on that sobering thought we'll bid you good night and farewell at Cortina City and look out for the part two of this which will come up pretty quickly and um, we could have had five clocks by the way if I'd have got that one out of there but didn't we do well didn't they do well to get that out of there and to get it going and you shared the journey with me so we'll move on to the speedometer and the rev counter and getting the the dishwasher part done and the bulbs i've ordered some led bulbs so in part two we'll see a completed build it's just that the time clock thing it's got to be right if you're going to do all this work why not get your time clock so that it actually runs nicely when I looked at the contacts on these, they're brand new, lovely shiny contacts, so these have done no work. 
the other two a little bit pitted and we filed them in as you know and obviously we did the repair on this XL one just to see for fun if we could get it going and we did all right and then we can listen to this I wonder if they'll all stay in sync I did start these off and straight away now we've lost synchronization these were synchronized perhaps not when I started the film and they drifted out straight away wouldn't it be nice to get all the second hands going at the same time but it looks like we've got discrepancies up between these two let's start one let's pause one at 12 I'm supposed to be finishing aren't I look I'm off again pause one at 12 let the other one keep going till that reaches 12 then release see which one goes one go it's a clock race straight away then the right hand side one is no so far it's neck and neck at Cortina City coming up to Beaches Brook now and we do have a leader is the third from the left takes the lead being a faster clock see how that second out straight away so you imagine that over a period of 24 hours how much gain there's going to be so we need to synchronize these together i think what would be a good thing to do would be and this may be we may have answered our own questions here what a great bit of brainstorming then as we extend the film yet again and you go oh god is he still going on yeah i am still going on okay here we go how about then if we get one clock to be our master clock let's say it is bramble's clock let's say bramble's clock manages to keep perfect time okay or if it doesn't we set it until it does and then once we've got Bramble's clock at perfect time we can then get these and instead of having to wait hours and hours and hours if the second hands all stay together the chances are the clocks with Bramble the chances are these clocks are in the same setting if straight away we notice the second hands drift we can then use a tuning screw at the back and start the process again and maybe that will give us a fighting chance to calibrate these I don't know it's an interesting one because it does take a while otherwise to wait a day between adjustments you know but uh, Deb one of those is definitely faster the one on the left is faster it's gaining although I must admit now they seem to have come back online what what's going on they're not actually they actually are still together there Am I talking a load of old cobblers? Is it is it my eyes? No, they seem to be seem to be together. Wow. At that point, I've went to the is it the angle of the on the bench? I think it may be the angle on the bench that I'm looking at them at. I don't know. Uh, we need to get Bramble's second hand in, in line with these now. So I'm going to, when it comes to this hand, I'm going to let Bramble's second hand stall. And let's see if all three of these can join up forces together. I'm playing, aren't I? Why don't you get on and restore your Cortina, Pete? I'm messing about. I'm messing about with old clocks. You know why I'm doing it, because we're OCD and we want these to be right. And we want to learn as well. So that's why we're doing it. What am I answering my own questions for? Cracking up. Right. Ready to release. Go. All right. Um, yeah, what can I say? But, uh, we'll see how these keep time or not. Are we synchronizing the XLs one too? Look we'll my shoe. We will when it gets around there. Too late now, I'll have to do another pass. Is one louder than the other? I'd say how you'd be able to tell which clock. I probably can't, but the microphone on this camera will probably be able if I pan you really close, let me know which one was the loudest clock tick well, I'll do two passes as well bit of fun for you keep your mate so you can go to sleep because I know some people Simon Perrin a big shout out to our 
resident insomniac Simon who he just can't sleep so this shout out to Simon there Cider Andy as well is on board <clears throat> and a and Andrew Price Andrew Price is on board I'm gonna hold this one there we're gonna see how much we go out of sync over a period of time you could put the camera on long play all right and um, just fast forward it and you might see it a lot quicker I might do that I might leave the tripod running leave the camera running for an hour and supply it to you at the end of the film fast forward for now I'll synchronize all four clocks go huh I managed to stop that clock I think you can catch up a little bit be really careful though I think that's it this one may have a fault on it the mechanism I have cleaned it but if I'm able to stop it and it won't restart then that's a faulty one we'll have to keep our eye on that so, I mean, it's never turned off since a couple of hours but I'll say a couple of hours no that was brambles we'll keep our eye on that now let's do that pan in and let's get out of here you've had enough of me here we go sound check then It's a whole new day. This could be the very final clip of this clock build part one. You saw the wiper uh, module just getting finished off with that loom, and you saw me taking the dash pods apart and then laying out the items. Okay, and some shocking news just in before the end of the film closes. My brand new plexi arrived, but guess look how it arrived with a, a crack straight in it so it's gonna have to go back what a shame I was ready I could have used that anyway let's not think about that let's just send it back but the clocks have been left overnight so I think about uh, I left them running around the 8 o'clock mark so 10 11 to about 12 hours running now so let's see the time let's go over to the time just before we close I keep promising we're gonna close this this um, wiper build part two and clock part one it's 11.51 11.51 so who wins who loses so the XL referred clocks bang on the money at 11.51 the XL clock then maybe it is because of the low mileage 16,000 so the low the XL looks like 51 
Bramble losing there by two minutes, three minutes, three minutes late on Bramble's clock. The new old stock ones, another 51, so that's okay. And then a one minute on the other new old stock, so a minute late, bang on. Bramble three minutes late, and XL bang on as well. So XL a new old stock win with uh, Bramble in the Bramble losing. New old stock two in third place and Bramble in fourth place. But uh, it's time for the screwdriver on Bramble to increase that. So we're running another 12 hours. We'll increase the, the, the screw thread at the back and increase the gain some time on it. Uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for all your support on YouTube and Patreon. Without Patreon and YouTube, I just can't do it. If you've not been on Patreon, get across and help us out. It does help me keep banging the videos out. Um, so that's a, a little Patreon plug at the end. Please help us. Uh, and then, um, yeah, we appreciate the comments, all the constructive feedback that's been coming in. Pete C, Cortina City on the Dash Clock Build, Part 1. And a little bit of finishing off on that wiper loom. Concluding then this tech video that you all seem to like. We'll catch you in Part 2. So it's Cortina City over and out. And uh, an enjoyable chat this evening, one presumes, in that live chat box, isn't it fun? So, uh, get to bed everybody, I don't know time, it's probably about 10 o'clock is it, half 10? Making a guess of course as I make the video, with no idea roughly what time it will be. Over and out PC, Cortina City, a new video coming very soon. Don't forget, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell so you know when I've uploaded the new films. A lot of people saying, I didn't know you had a new film, there's a little bell thing, I didn't know about it, I had to press that. Leave a comment, I'll try and reply to you, but there was that many last time, I'm still lagging behind on my replies, apologies, I will get there. In the meantime, any news that you want is on Patreon, pictures and updates, and things you don't always see on YouTube. Over and out. TikTok. Shop shop. Gotta go. Hello again. Do you, see, do you like that little bit of blank screen? <laughs> uh, I think I got it wrong with the XL clock. Sorry. Uh, you have to sign you all out and said goodnight and goodbye. And he's bloody back again. Let's wait till it gets to 12 o'clock. I won't actually do it in real time, but I think 12 o'clock will give us an easy way to read all the dials at once. So in four minutes time, we'll probably check them. Hold on. Okay, this is the real test. The midday test. Over we go. Who wins? Right, XL. Repair. Four minutes fast. Bramble. Three minutes slow. New old stock clock. Correct. New old stock, stock clock two. Four minutes fast. So, this one is the correct time and this is the one we'll now use to calibrate all the rest. And that's how we're going to do it. So you'll see that finished in part two so at least we reported back on what we actually got there so it's just a question of the watchmaker screwdriver and use this as the calibrating one off we go then and we'll now see you soon i thought i thought i'd better leave this info in at the end of the film because it's valuable information I keep saying i'm going that's three times now the middle sorry the third from the left clock has kept time good as I said, the others various ahead or behind. So, never, this is how I'm going to adjust them, never touch that one. Using the second hands, they must all stay in synchronization over 10 minutes, initially anyway. So if you look at them, I'll monitor those. And any that drift, you just turn backwards or forwards in each 10 minute segment till you zone them in and you get closer and closer, but never adjust at least one because you need a datum point. <clears throat> you could just use a normal clock, of course, as well to uh, get it, but I think this is right. But we could do this with a, a, a quartz clock, an accurate clock at the back, using the second hand on that and then matching all the clocks to that one. You don't have to do it uh, this way, but you can tell as well when they're uh, all running together because the sound changes how interesting is that 
If you listen now. They're virtually all running together. And you can tell if one's out because the sound kind of like goes out of sync, synchronization. You've got different frequencies. There's a point where they're all harmonious. And then you'll get some interesting sort of phase shifts, if you will. And that's when you can tell and each, the phase shifting has gone, reduced itself as I've been tweaking them up. Because I've done quite a few tweaks now on the little screw at the back and the phase shifting is becoming less pronounced so when I say phase shift if you've got a, a waveform sort of bumps on a waveform well, all the waveforms are in the same pattern and that they lay on top of each other and you can't tell but if one's ahead you get a bump and then immediately after another bump because it's not quite sitting behind it like shadowed behind it if you will and you can hear that in the sounds are you a clock buff? Do you find clocks really interesting like I do? Have you been hypnotized by this video? Look into my clocks. Don't look around my clocks, look directly into my clocks. You're feeling, Jim, you're feeling very sleepy. I don't really know why any of you have ever bothered watching this video right to the end. You're feeling very sleepy. Think of waves crashing on a beach. The sun on your back as you lie on the soft golden sand. The woman of your dreams lying by you as the waves crash in the distance. Seagulls circle overhead with the odd screech. Don't leave your fish and chips too close unattended, they might steal them. An ice cream van drives past in the distance, children are playing, and the waves carry on crashing. And you're feeling very sleepy. As the waves roll. And the sun warms your back. And all your problems, all your Cortina problems drift away, just distant memories now. As you drift, you're feeling very light and relaxed. Feel all the muscles in your body, all the tension unwinding. With each wave that crashes, more and more problems slip away. Dissolve, a bit like Cortina body panels. Sleep now. This is Cortina City relaxation video. Listen to my voice. Sleep now. Sleep now. A couple of tweaks later and everything's looking very synchronized. So look at that. Look at that wiggle. Listen to that noise. Oh it's like a Jaguar engine, not a pinto. Mind you, we have got four clocks. Four cylinders. Can you hear the aircraft going overhead? There's a, a test pilot doing engine stalls. Do you want to stay here all night? This is getting ridiculous. Look at those second hands. Keep your eyes on them. This is artistic license. 
Now do we have Bramble slightly drifting? The right and two are bang on. I think Bramble's losing a little bit. Coming up to the three, let's have a look. Now, yeah, Bramble's running late. It's drifted a bit. So that's what we do. I'm writing on my bench what adjustment I've made. <laughs> this is very sort of rough and ready, but it works. So I'm going to give Brambles a little tweak right down slow and readjust it. But I'm going to let you get back to sleep. It's a little wake up and I've just got some uh, our whites lemonade out of the fridge. So sorry I woke you up. Get back to bed, everyone. Oh, it's the money. Oh, it's the money. Oh, it's... That's the Elvis Costello's dad.